Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trustees Conservation in Action webinar series. My name is Nick Black. I'm the Managing Director of the Boston Waterfront Initiative here at the Trustees, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and hope you're excited to get an in-depth look at how we care for and even now create our special places here at the Trustees. Uh, each one of our 120 properties has its own unique history and treasures to offer, and our team of stewards, curators, ecologists, and many others all play a role and bringing these environments to life. Today, you'll hear about the exceptional work we are doing uh, to create the Pierce Park 3 project here in East Boston. And these efforts would not be possible without the support of our donors, and we cannot thank them and you enough. As the world has gone virtual these past two years, and we've created online programming like this webinar series, our team has also done an incredible job keeping our properties open and operating safely. We saw over 2 million visitors to our properties last year, as many people gained a renewed appreciation for, for nature and for getting outside. I hope this webinar will inspire you to get out and explore the trustee, some trustees' properties and to help you learn about our many new projects and initiatives. If Pierce Park 3 is of particular interest, our team will be offering monthly tours of the park site in East Boston. You will receive an email with details on how to register for this walking tour following today's webinar. We believe this work will help us get the next generation outside and build the trustees of the future. Thanks again for supporting our mission and for protecting and thanks again for, excuse me, for supporting our mission to protect and share the places people love. Uh, we will be, uh, taking questions and answers at the end of this presentation. Um, so if you have a question that you would like to ask, go ahead and just hit the Q&A button at the bottom and we will uh, collect those questions and ask them and answer them at the end. Uh, also next to the Q&A button, you will see a live transcript option. If you would like to enable closed captions uh, to appear at the bottom of your screen, please select live transcript and show subtitle. Thank you. Now for our program, uh, we're very excited to share with you today some updated designs for the Pierce Park 3 project in East Boston. Uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to invite you to hear from two of my colleagues here at the trustees with whom we've been working closely over the last year as this project has transformed from imagined vision to implemented reality. Uh, joining me today is Jen Klein, the trustees director of outdoor experience and Vijay Tiku, our director of uh, our Greater Boston Properties. Both Jen and Vijay are here to discuss how the work of the Boston Waterfront Initiative, One Waterfront, and the Pierce Park 3 Project are deeply connected to the overall trustees' mission. I am grateful uh, that they are here today and look forward to hearing what they have to say. And with that, Jen, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Nick. And thanks, everyone, for choosing to spend your lunchtime with us today. Um, as Nick said, I'm Jen Klein, Director of Outdoor Experience with the Trustees. Since our founding, the Trustees have focused our work on connecting people to nature and giving people access to high quality open space. It's really through having these memorable, magical outdoor experiences that we grow to love nature and get connected to our place. And at the Trustees, we really are in the business of creating and stewarding experiences that connect our communities to nature and to our special places, be those urban, rural, or in suburban communities. We've been doing this work for a really long time. However, in our current strategic plan, we call out with greater intention the need for inspiration and connection to nature. There's a lot of environmental challenges that we're facing today and that we're likely to face in the near and far term future. And without experiences in nature, we just can't have environmentally literate and civically engaged communities. And at the trustees, we believe that everyone is entitled to access to high quality outdoor spaces where they can connect to nature and build sense of place. So across the organization, we're approaching this work in many different ways, in many different communities and across many of our properties. From summer camp opportunities for kids to spend time outdoors, 
building relationships, connecting to nature, to self-guided experiences where our members and community members can explore on their own, to creating nature and adventure play spaces where kids can grow and develop that special connection to nature. We also have our family programs that are incredibly popular across the state to enhancing our recreational opportunities, whether that's through hiking experiences, paddling experiences, or as of late, lots of snowshoe and cross-country ski adventures. And then we're looking at our work through building partnerships with schools and other educational institutions to really um, connect more young people to nature and the outdoors. And then finally, one thing that we're very excited to start very soon is our launch of our mobile engagement unit, where we can bring the trustees experience to communities where we may not have physical properties. So for our work in Boston, in the One Water, one waterfront, sorry, um, we're presented with an exceptional opportunity to grow the trustees of the future through engagement in an urban park, in an urban ecosystem. As many know, our planet is becoming more and more urbanized. And as such, we really have to do all that we can to create more spaces and experiences in urban communities for both the benefit of humans, but also for the benefit of nature. So our approach in Boston, we're looking at our outdoor and environmental education and engagement at Pierce Park through a social ecological lens. And we're using that model to really guide our work. High quality urban green space and urban environmental and outdoor education programming has been shown to enhance people's physical health through lower rates of diabetes, um, lower rates of blood pressure. It's been shown to enhance people's mental health through feeling less anxious or depressed when in, op when in open space, uh, in enhancing people's social health by creating spaces where people can have bonds with community and family. And it, it's shown to enhance overall community health. And with that comes strong ecological health. So put another way, Basically what's good for nature is good for human systems as well. So for the short term, our work in Boston is gonna showcase a number of initiatives that are gonna help us reach our goals to connect more people to nature and build that strong social ecological system. So this includes launching our mobile engagement unit this summer in Boston, continuing with ongoing family programming in East Boston and beyond, and then developing and stewarding strong partnerships in the community, especially in the public health space, and then creating unique recreational experiences for the community. And looking ahead with this work, we're really aiming to be thought leaders in this space. We will use this park and this process as a learning laboratory for research on public health, access to green space, climate resiliency, urban environmental education, and community engagement. We're actively working with partners currently, universities here in Massachusetts and beyond to start to think about what this living laboratory might look like. We're serving as a model for collaboration between public, private, corporate, state, and municipal partners. We're a model for community engagement and participatory planning. And we're also serving as a model for what is high quality outdoor, urban, environmental education and recreational opportunities look like. So with that, I'm gonna stop there uh, and I'm gonna pass it over to Vidya, who's gonna share a little bit more about what's happening and what's coming on the programming uh, front for Boston and beyond. Thanks, Jen. Um, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Vidya Tiku. I'm the director for Greater Boston with the trustees. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'd like to take you through our current presence in Boston and give you a peep into the context for the water initiative um, 
work that's being done here. So today, the trustees is the largest owner of community gardens in Boston. We own 56 gardens in eight neighborhoods, um, about 15 acres uh, in total. There are about 200 gardens in the city, which we also champion um, and really are the thought leaders and uh, are the most recognized organization uh, for championing these open spaces. Um, I, we have a network of about 100 to 120 volunteers give and take any given year that helps us really run these gardens. The gardens are truly um, representative of their neighborhoods. The food being grown here is estimated. Uh, we're doing a study with Dartmouth and I'll put a leg out and say, I think we're estimating over $2 million worth of fresh food being grown in these gardens that is supplementing family food budgets. Um, we have nearly 10,000 people being fed uh, in these gardens, um, and then another 15,000 that engage with us currently in garden programming, um, recently online, but in person, of course, as we come out of COVID. Um, we are also, next slide, please, Nick. We are also connecting our statewide agricultural program with the communities in Boston with our mobile market. Uh, food being grown at our farms, mainly Proisit Farm in Dover, is being um, distributed to uh, financially challenged families in Boston and Cambridge. We have nine locations currently, about 470 CSA shares being given out, uh, 45 of which are now in East Boston, uh, thanks to a partnership with the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center there. Um, I'm proud to say all 100% of these CSA shares are subscribed for families that qualify for HIP and SNAP. Um, and it is, I think, about $60 to $80 worth of food uh, each time that these families are getting uh, with, the, uh, with the shares that they have. So, you know, the gardens are helping us connect with the gardeners and the abutters. There are about 125,000 people that live within a quarter mile of our 56 gardens. And then with the mobile market, we are able to expand that reach and you know, reach people who may not be able to garden, but still need access to fresh food. Um, next one, please, Nick. Um, this is my favorite slide. Um, and now with the Boston Waterfront Initiative, we are really being able to invest in the next generation, something that Jen spoke about. Um, these are our next stewards for open spaces. You know, we, um, this will be our third year. Um, a dozen uh, teenagers uh, from East, um, East Boston, Chelsea, Revere, uh, and a couple from further down are now um, spending their summers with us. Um, they're doing peer-to-peer -peer exchange, education, environmental education, coastal resilience, and really um, pulling the community that they live in into these um, uh, thought, um, thought questions and you know, um, review of what really it means to be a neighborhood that is uh, going to be challenged with climate change uh, uh, impacts. And they are a force to reckon with, and uh, we are very excited to get this program launched. Um, next one. And then starting, I would say, last June, we started a really series of different uh, programs to engage the community in East Boston. Um, if you know the neighborhood, it is immensely rich in diversity. And as we have done our um, surveys, we have learned, as I think we kind of knew already, but the surveys really reinforced that, you know, Connecting with the cultural audiences and making everybody feel welcome and have equity and access, not just from the physical um, space, but also opportunities that are being offered, programming, education, uh, family fun activities really has to make sure that we are catering to, you know, who lives in that neighborhood. Um, so we had a really successful series of programs last summer. Um, everything you can see from, you know, salsa dancing, Brazilian um, lessons, and the Brazilian martial arts at Constitution Beach. We did Pierce Park. We did Mary Ellen Welch Greenway, Maverick Square. We were at farmers markets. We did um, Greenway bike rides. Um, really anything that we can draw people to connect with their own personal histories with the waterfronts, wherever they may have um, 
come from and to engage with them in this communication around what's needed for Peer Spark One as we move ahead. We have a really, um, I think a very exciting lineup coming up for the next summer. So please stay tuned. We, in just about five months, were able to engage with about 3,000 people in East Boston last year. And we are hoping to grow that dramatically. Um, and, you know, I think it's, um, I was bewildered at first when um, I was asked to start this programming. We don't really have a park, but I think uh, this underscores the need that, you know, this is a, this is a, a lineup to what's coming. We have really great partnerships in East Boston. We have worked very closely with the communities here. We have a lot of partners in place and everybody is really rooting for us um, to get the space um, built. Uh, next one, Nick. This will be my last one, which is basically, you know, so this is the work ahead for us, for Jen, Nick, um, me and everybody else who's involved with this work is to kind of brand the trustees Everybody knows us as one of the three right now, I would say. We obviously have a very strong presence in the food access world, with the mobile market, with the gardens. Uh, we are known for conservation in action statewide, obviously, um, and in Boston. But I think the audiences are not cross-connected. And I think the work ahead for us to really build this brand and introduce the trustees and bring all these audiences together for us. Um, so that our work with conservation, food access, and community engagement, DBIE, building the next generation, can all be, you know, can all be viewed together um, to make, to, I, would, I would say to introduce the trustees to everybody in Boston. I'd say that's fair. So with that, um, you know, I'll take any questions towards the end, but I'll hand it over to Nick right now to take it from here. Thank you, Vidya, and thank you, Jen, for uh, that insightful overview of the work that you are both doing uh, in and around Boston and how it connects to the, the broader trustees mission. Um, again, as Vidya said, we are going to be taking questions and answers at the end here. So if you think of something right now uh, and just want to type out a question in the Q&A box, feel free to go ahead and do that. And uh, we'll get to those in just a second. Uh, but now I just want to talk a little bit more specifically about where we are with the Pierce Park 3 project. Uh, as you heard Vijay say, we conducted a, a lot of outreach and engagement uh, activities over the past year or so in East Boston. Part of that was, as she said, to introduce ourselves to the community, uh, in some ways introduce East Boston to the uh, rest of uh, Boston, because a, a lot of folks who live in and around Boston don't haven't spent a lot of time in East Boston, and so we were really trying to attract people there. Um, but our third and probably most important uh, reason for engaging with all these folks over, over the past year or so is to get their input and feedback. Uh, it's been very important to us all along to understand as we advance the design for Piers Park Phase 3, what do people want to see here and what would make them want to come here and how would they feel a sense of belonging here. And so all of the engagement work that was done by both the Waterfront Ambassadors, as well as our engagement group with uh, everybody that we interacted with, was really done with an eye towards getting feedback and responses from them about what they wanted to see in their park. Uh, so excited to share today that we had over a thousand responses to a community design survey that was operational for much of last year. Uh, about 20% of those Spanish uh, 20% of those responses, excuse me, came to us in Spanish. Um, and of the folks who actually gave us their zip code to indicate where they lived, uh, uh, more than half of them, almost 60% of them uh, lived in East Boston. Uh, there is, if you are interested, an executive summary of that design survey on our website. If you go to onewaterfront.org slash BP3, uh, you can check out all of those responses there. But to look more specifically at Pierce Part 3, when we look at this site, really for us, we see nothing but potential for transformation. Uh, through uh, current, uh, Although this currently is a potential threat uh, to both public safety and environmental conditions, we see it as a framework for an immersive public landscape rich in history, as well as native ecologies. Uh, this project is gonna have a significant impact on the East Boston waterfront beyond the limits just of our immediate site. Its connection to where you see there, the phase two of Pierce Park, as well as the original Pierce Park, as well in, uh, is 
the, the whole of East Boston is gonna create a new gym of open space right on the edge of our harbor. Uh, there is an existing open space network along the harbor front, a mix of public realm parks and streetscapes connecting Eagle Hill to Jeffreys Point and to the ICA watershed, a network that is currently interrupted by the sites for phase two and phase three of Pierce Park. The completion of two and three uh, will complete this open space network with a significant public park connecting both Jeffreys Point uh, as, as well as low, Lower Eagle Hill down to Boston Harbor. Altogether, phases one, two, and three will provide 14 and a half acres of public open space, a landscape that's more than twice the size of Christopher Columbus Park in Boston's North End. When complete, the three phases will provide more than a mile of accessible waterfront trails for walking or jogging. We've been working closely throughout the last year or so with the design team uh, for phases one and two to develop a single vision for Piers Park. And to see that, and we really see this as one park with complementary characteristics and programs. Phase one is largely seen as a passive waterfront park. And phase two is a bit more active with lawns for ball playing, exercise equipment, a splash pad and a playground. On phase three, we envision an immersive landscape, one that is entirely about connecting to nature and access to the water. We've been looking more closely at coastal landscapes and trustees reservations for inspiration, like Gary Island that you see here in Mar Marblehead, that's only accessible by foot during low tide. Similarly, nearby on the rocky landscape of Crown and Shield Island, where you can stand on elevated ground and looking down on swirling tide pools teeming with marine life. But we also have aspirations for phase three and really all of Pierce Park more broadly to become a destination landscape on Boston Harbor. World's End, of course, is a very different scale, but we're excited by the idea that when completed, this is a park that of course will serve the immediate neighborhoods, but also invites people from greater Boston and beyond to spend a day in the park and accessing the harbor in a way that just simply doesn't currently exist in the city. All of this is still very much in line with the concept that we have developed over the past couple of years through meetings and surveys and the conversations we've been having with permitting agencies. The last plan that we presented, which you can see here on the screen, uh, was designed to engage with the water in many of the same ways we are talking about even today. But we've been reading and listening to feedback as we continue to push the design forward. Some of the most formative feedback we've received, you can now see on the screen here. Lots of encouragement to preserve more of the site's human history. It was interesting for us to think about and learn that we were showing a loose frame of piles left behind to outline the footprint of the pre-existing pier, but maybe there should be other artifacts to consider leaving behind as well. The previous plan also uh, included lots of open water. Access to the water is great, but it felt like too much of the site was given up to water and more accessible landscapes would be great. We were showing just a single access point connecting the uplands of phase two. We heard lots of requests to consider additional access points and some great feedback regarding the habitat that we're looking to establish. How do we make sure that these are healthy and robust ecological zones within the park? All of this together and many of the other things that we heard about the design suggested a need for a better integration and connection between phases one and two of Pierce Park. And it gave us a good direction to head back to the drawing board with our design team. And so I'm excited to share with you that this is the new and we think improved design drawing for phase three, responding to some of that feedback that we received. Uh, we're excited about the evolution of this project and think we're headed in a direction that allows for more programming, while also improving on the quality of the marine and uplands habitat that we're bringing to the site. First of all, we've significantly increased access to the park. We're looking into ways that Pierce Park might be connected to either the water taxi network in Boston Harbor or some other way of water transportation connections, uh, bringing people to and from the park more easily. But we've also incorporated two pedestrian bridges between the uplands of phase two and the coastal landform of phase three. These two connections between phases two and three have been created 
to protect an area for establishing salt marshes and tidal pools right at the entrance of phase three. We're particularly excited about this idea of crossing over and through a robust ecological habitat as the approach to phase three. This brings the larger aspirations for this uh, to perform as a resilient ecological park right to the foreground as you arrive. We see this as a diverse mix of salt, salt marshes, tide pools, and foreground views of the park and the city beyond, and that the protected waters could be safe enough to allow for outdoor classrooms and educational programming and discovery. Those native ecological zones are of course beautiful in peak summer, but we think it will be equally beautiful in the middle of a snowy Boston winter as well. We're looking into additional ways to preserve the artifacts of the pier, a place that used to move people and goods in and out of East Boston and should not be overlooked as an important piece of this site's history. In addition to developing strategies to retain some of the piles at the pier's perimeter, we're also looking to keep uh, looking at ways to keep some of them within those protected waters of that proposed marsh and tide pool. The current plan suggests that the salt marsh might be dotted with artifacts like the concrete pile caps of wood or wood piles that could also serve as a mollusk habitat and perches for migratory birds in the marsh. And the images that you see here are of uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park in New York City where very similarly, they created uh, an ecological habitat around an old pier, and you can see how those old uh, pier remnants have been enveloped by the, nat the natural landscape and really uh, add an interesting component to uh, the, the park itself. Uh, we've continued to develop and expand upon the ways in which the park offers opportunities to engage with the harbor. This is something that came through loud and clear in our uh, design survey work. And uh, that this is a park that will largely be defined by many of the ways that it brings people down to the water's edge. Uh, it will, of course, be wrapped in a robust and resilient edge capable of withstanding daily tidal cycles, storm surges, and constant wave energy. But there will also be many areas in the park where the rocky edges might become more organized and designed to invite people to sit comfortably at the edge of the harbor. We imagine areas like the one pictured here with the rocky edge becoming more uh, a more organized amphitheater at the water's edge during high tide. But as the tide goes out, the rocky tide pool emerges where student groups can safely explore and discover mean marine life that is thriving in an intertidal habitat shells. The uplands of phases three of, of phase three are not intended to replicate the uplands of phases one and two. While one and two offer large civic lawns, we see the uplands of phase three offering a series of immersive coastal woodlands, some meadows, and even clearings. The lawns of phase three are relatively intimate in scale, oriented for views of the city skyline in one direction and deep views of the harbor in the other. They are connected by robust immersive landscapes and as a collection of clearings have the capacity to support events on the harbor. We're also in the very early stages of developing a design for either a pavilion or a, an intended structure uh, to support outdoor programming and events. Uh, the yellow box that you see on the screen here suggests that there might be a building embedded actually into that landform um, that's intended to support a busy calendar of events organized by the trustees and some of our local partners. We see this as a shelter looking out over the salt marsh that borrows from the events plaza immediately in front of it. So that covers a, a high level overview of the design updates. Now we're really digging into the details of the schematic design with our design and engineering teams right now. And we're gonna to continue to develop a detailed design package for consideration uh, as we move throughout the year. We're also continuing to have an open dialogue with the reviewing and permitting agencies so that we are responding to their feedback while the design process is still ongoing. And we look forward to beginning construction sometime in the uh, early spring or summer of 2023. And finally, to continue to uh, foster a robust community dialogue about the ongoing design process and uh, throughout the rest of the project, 
Uh, we've launched a community feedback site through a platform called Co-Urbanize. Uh, we chose to add this interactive site to uh, the site that we currently have available to allow for more interactive features, including a comment wall, uh, an interactive timeline, uh, the ability for individuals to engage either through uh, mobile and, and text uh, commenting, so it doesn't necessarily require uh, internet access to engage with it. It also has better multilingual translations available. Uh, and so we hope we will, you can join us on the co-urbanized site to continue the conversation and share your feedback with the team. Uh, and we would encourage you to do that uh, by going to onewaterfront.org slash feedback. Uh, onewaterfront.org, of course, is the, the microsite that we've maintained throughout the project where you can also sign up for blog updates, um, as well as keep tabs on some of the things that we're reading and learning about on um, uh, a weekly basis as this project has moved forward. And would love to, to have you engaged there. Uh, so with that, I think we are ready to take your questions. Uh, so again, uh, there's the Q&A button at the bottom there. So if you have a question, go ahead and uh, pop it in the chat or, or pop it in the box there. Uh, and then our my friend Javon here will come on and uh, start asking those questions. And we'd love to, to work through them together. Uh, Javon, do we have yes, any questions? Hi. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jen and Vidya. Uh, we do have a few questions here. So... <clears throat> Can this park address climate changes? Yeah, so for those of you who have been following this process from the beginning, um, and not only just the Pierce Park process, but really the, the Boston Waterfront Initiative and, and the One Waterfront Vision, it has always been intended to um, bring, as we say, value to Boston's climate resiliency goals. Um, and there's a couple ways that we think about doing that and that we're looking at that in this site in particular. First of all, it's how do we build a landscape that is itself robust and resilient? Um, and some of the design elements that you see um, in the park, and I'll just switch back over to that picture so you can see that, um, uh, really do try and, and, and take that into account. So first and foremost, we'll be looking at um, future projections of uh, sea level rise and building our park to those elevations to make sure that it isn't underwater on a regular basis. Um, those robust and resilient edges, the riprap, the rocks around the edges are intentionally designed to withstand things like tidal flooding, storm surges and the like. Um, and as well, you know, the development of those coastal habitats and those salt marshes, while uh, internally contained in the park itself, uh, we're actually looking at ways to allow for it to, to migrate out and, and become part of the, the overall landscape of the park itself. And so, um, there's a number of different ways that we're looking at this park as not only a place that is itself resilient, but then can also start to model and demonstrate the ways open space and living shorelines can be implemented to help uh, offer protection for other areas of the city of Boston behind it. And so uh, there's a, a lot of conversation and thought going into resiliency and this project. And it's something that uh, is going to continue to, to be a part of it. So I, I think that's a great question and I appreciate you asking it. Thank you. Um, will construction of phase three take place from the water and how will access to phase two be impacted if not? So that's a great question, one that we are currently working to, to figure out uh, in a number of different ways. So first and foremost, we're working closely with Massport on this project. Um, just to kind of back up from a bigger picture perspective, uh, if, if you haven't followed this process all the way through, so phase two is being designed and constructed by Massport. Uh, they own and operate phase one, um, and they're building out phase two as part of a commitment they made to the East Boston community uh, some years ago. Uh, so we're working with Massport to build out phase three. Uh, we, their trustees, have taken on responsibility for that uh, parcel, but as I talked about earlier, uh, we really want to make sure that these parks are all three integrated and they feel like one big place, which obviously uh, takes a lot of coordination. Uh, the phase two site and the development for it has advanced uh, pretty substantially. They started that process way back in 2017. Um, we were just designated by Massport to be the developers for phase three in 2020. Uh, so we've been working furiously to get caught up from a design perspective. Um, but the idea is that there will be some coordination and overlap of construction of both phase two and phase three. 
Uh, so to answer the first part of that question, I anticipate that there will be some portions of phase three that are probably going to be built from the water. Um, there's a, a good bit of demolition that obviously has to take place that will almost certainly be done from the water. Uh, but we're currently in the process of identifying construction managers and, and other uh, technical professionals who will be able to answer those questions with far more specificity than, than I will be able to. Uh, secondly, we are working with the phase two team to get as much work as done as possible um, before or while both parks are still under construction. Now, phase two is obviously an upland park that doesn't happen in the water and is a bit more technically uh, straightforward than, than what we're looking at for phase three. Uh, and so I would anticipate that that construction will probably wrap up before we actually have completed the phase two park. So there will be a bit of a, a, a time lag. lag uh, for the overall construction. Uh, but we are working really diligently with Massport and the community to, to make sure that as much of phase two as possible is gonna be accessible while we also have some uh, both land side access as well as, well as water side access to the phase three site because uh, it is the type of project that is gonna require access for both. But as we get deeper into the construction process, we are going to have a number of community meetings that outlines our plans for construction, takes feedback, make sure that we're taking into account any concerns that the community might have and uh, answer those questions in far more specificity once once we have uh, the construction folks on the ground ready to, to handle that work. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Um, Vidya, what kind of programs have worked well last year? Um, let's see. So I think um, the ones that connect most or offer opportunities for the different cultures that exist in neighbor in this neighborhood, um, the family festivals that we have done. These are um, uh, longer festivals that include everything from uh, food um, uh, explorations, salsa concerts. Um, dancing, Brazilian martial arts, uh, participation in the Mexican Independence Day was a great one, um, Halloween, um, and even I think our pop-up programs at the farmer's market at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, uh, they've all received really great uh, participation. Uh, I will say that in my many, many years of programming East Boston, uh, I think we've made a really breakthrough here. Um, we have great staff that are local and bilingual, and we have had um, programs for the first time where you know the program is offered in Spanish, um, and most of the participation is from Spanish-speaking families, which is really a first for us. Um, I always joke I was at this at this event where like it was. 100% Spanish and you know I can understand a little bit but but it was great to be in a place honestly after so many years where you know I could hear something something the trustees something something Veronica Rubles Cultural Center something you know it I think we have pierced uh, a level here where we have got a lot of participation from the Latin um country immigrants, and also we're hoping to get more from East uh, Asians. I hope Thank that you. Um, is there any consideration of interpretive panels to complement the man-made elements left behind? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's always a, an important part of any historical site and, and something that I think the trustees really focuses on. I mean, we have an entire, um, cultural wing of the, of the uh, organization that really focuses on both the, the understanding and the interpretation of these sites. And so we will certainly bring to bear all of our experience and resources to make sure that while we're creating a really engaging and immersive landscape, we aren't losing sight of, of where this place has been and, and the fascinating history that goes along with um, both this pier and then also this waterfront in East Boston. Uh, many folks may not know, this is really considered Boston's Ellis Island. Uh, there was a, a, a large number of immigrants that came to and through the city of Boston that arrived on boats on these piers that came into America and that's where their stories began. And so 
we're always very interested in the history of these sites, telling the stories of the people uh, that lived and worked here. Uh, these, of course, were former industrial sites. This entire complex used to be a big rail yard of trains that would come in and bring grains from the grain from the Midwest to put on steamer ships to send across over to England. And so uh, there's a very rich cultural history, there's a rich industrial history, and all of those things that, that we're really looking to both keep and incorporate and talk about as we move this project forward and, and, and bring it uh, to the public. Thank you again. Um, is there an estimate on phase three or how will this project um, be funded? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is a project that the trustees is committed to taking on um, the, the, the capital construction for the project. So what that means is that we are uh, raising um, through our philanthropic connections all of the money that it's going to take to build this project. And so um, that's something that um, has been part of this work all along, really from the beginning, uh, really demonstrating that we have uh, the support to do that. Um, and to date, I'm happy to share, we, we have over, uh, I want to say $26.5 million of commitments to the construction of this, this place. Um, but it's going to take more than that, believe it or not. Uh, we are still trying to figure out exactly how much the, the park will cost and getting more specific with the design and completing the schematic design phase, which we're looking to wrap up here in just a couple months, probably late spring or early summer will give us a lot of information and, and more concrete answers on terms of how much it will actually cost to, to build the park. But of course, we're in a, a bit of an interesting period when it comes to construction projects, both uh, locally and, and, and uh, globally, I will say. So in, in terms of materials that are available and uh, uh, construction professionals that are available, all of those things will, will offer some challenges to the park itself. And so um, right now we've estimated that the park is probably going to cost about $35 million to construct. Um, it, that number could go up or down. I would probably say it'll go up before we go down. Um, but that, that's the, the sort of general goal that we're working with right now. And so uh, raising money through uh, private family foundations, uh, corporations, we've had a number of uh, great corporate sponsors um, that have stepped up to, to support this work. Uh, individual donors um, who have committed to this project, which is uh, wonderful to see. Uh, and then we're also working with our federal, state, and city leaders uh, to develop a, a, a modest but meaningful pipeline of public funding that, that will help support the project and, and move it forward. Thank you. And we have time just for a couple more questions here today. Um, most trustees sites have a nominal entry free fee for non-members. Will neighborhood residents receive fee, free or reduced entry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, some of our trustees properties do have nominal fees um, to, to access them. Some of them don't. Uh, this first and foremost is and will continue to be a public park uh, that is accessible and available to everyone. Uh, there won't be an admissions fee or any sort of entry gate uh, to enter phase three versus phase two or phase one. Uh, it's going to look and feel as though it is part of the larger Pierce Park complex. And so it's very important to us to make sure that everyone knows that, that everyone feels welcome to come there, and that uh, everyone who wants to uh, and has access to, to, to come spend uh, an hour or an afternoon or a full day in, in Pierce Park uh, is welcome to do that for sure. So no, there will be no entry fees uh, into this park. All right, um, NVIDIA, what plans do you have to integrate this great project into the greater East Boston community with its community gardens, greenway and diverse community connections? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, you know, like I referenced, the trustees and formerly uh, Boston National Areas Network have a really deep history in this neighborhood. Uh, we have been instrumental in the creation of the East Boston Greenway, uh, two community gardens, and a number of urban wilds in East Boston. Um, so we have been very mindful right from the start to really partner up with our open space friends in this neighborhood. 
um, you know, the heavyweights here, the Friends of Mary Ellen Welch Greenway, Pierce Pack, uh, Friends of Belle Al Marsh, uh, have been really working with us already very closely um, as we, you know, work with Massport and have been really championing this park with us and for us. Um, the second group I would say is the programming piece. So groups like Zoomix, uh, the Veronica Rubles Cultural Center, um, you know, these are groups um, that are helping us design and envision the programs that can be hosted in this park. And they have been instrumental in both designing and helping spread um, uh, the surveys that Nick spoke about. And then finally, I would say the third bucket is, you know, um, the health bucket. So we are exploring new partnerships with groups like the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center here um, and others uh, to explore, you know, how to provide healthy living and really a respite that I think, you know, our gardens also offer um, access to fresh food, um, passive recreation, mindfulness, um, immersive experiences. Um, I'm kind of really looking forward to the tide pool here and get the kids, you know, in there as well as the adults. Um, so I think we come with a very strong um, uh, group of partners here and we're looking to expand that rapidly. And I think collectively, like I said, the, the gardens and, you know, uh, the, the Pierce Park 3 will allow us collectively to work with city and state leaders, you know, um, and champion for more open space supportive policies at a much higher level, which I'm really excited about. And thank you. Um, Nick, if you could please close the webinar today. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate the questions. Um, I know there were a couple more that we didn't get to today, so we'll try and uh, answer those um, uh, more directly, and we'll probably post those online with both the webinar as, as well. Again, you can take a look at onewaterfront.org and um, uh, really be engaged in this project and, and understand some of what's going on, so we'd love to, to interact with you there. Uh, but finally, I uh, just want to say thank you for joining us again today. Uh, we do hope that you'll be joining us again next week for the eighth and final webinar in this series. Uh, it takes a look at the trustees agroecology work, which sounds very exciting. I'm gonna certainly tune in for that. Uh, but for all of our webinar recordings and a list of future webinars with registration links, please visit the trustees.org slash webinars. As a reminder, our team will be offering monthly tours of the Pierce Park 3 site, and we would love to have you join us to explore the site and the neighborhood. Uh, if you are on this, uh, webinar today. We'll send you an email afterwards uh, to invite you to do so. And uh, that will have dates and times when we will be over in East Boston giving those site tours and would love to see you there. Uh, and again, everything that you heard about today would not be possible without our donor donors, especially our top supporters like our Founders Circle members. So if you are one of those and are on the webinar today, thank you so much for your support. Uh, but broadly, we really appreciate the interest in this project um, and look forward to engaging uh, with everyone as, as it moves forward. So thanks again for joining today, uh, for investing in our mission and for being uh, a, and for believing in a brighter future. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>